and systems leadership. I want to start by extending a warm welcome to all of you, uh, participants and speakers uh, who are joining us today for this session. Thank you. I'm Miriam Vilela. I'm the executive director of our Earth Charter Center on Education that is located here in Costa Rica. Uh, this online session is organized by our Earth Charter Center on Education for Sustainable Development that is located here on the campus of the University for Peace in Costa Rica. This effort is part of our work as UNESCO Chair on Education for Sustainable Development. Um, and I'm very happy to, to welcome people who are joining us either through Zoom, through Facebook or YouTube. And uh, we have a, a group of people joining us from China because this event is being live streaming uh, to, through uh, a meeting platform called Tencent Meeting app in China. So thank you very much for those who are supporting us in doing that. Um, so given that system thinking is a key approach, or maybe we could say that is a key skill to understand and implement sustainability, uh, as such it is, uh, we could say, essential to education for sustainable development. We, want to, we wanted to organize a, a webinar, uh, this one, uh, to offer a space for all of us to deepen our understanding on what is really system thinking. So we envisioned this webinar that we called System Thinking, the skill to build sustainable, resilient systems and, and for help us to, to survive in, the, in a post-COVID-19 world. And we envisioned this as a space uh, for all of us to share thoughts on how we could understand system thinking and use that in the current times. I believe at the end of this session, we should have a, hopefully a better vision on the value of uh, being systems literate, especially in, for the current times. Um, so for this task, we invited three wonderful and special guests, guest speakers who are honoring us uh, with their participation. And I really want to, to thank uh, the three of you for joining us here. And uh, let me briefly um, introduce them. So first we have Anupan Sarap. Uh, Anupan is a system thinker and scientist. Um, He's professor of uh, sustainability and governance um, of complex uh, systems. And he's joining us uh, today from Pune, India. Anupan worked very closely with Donella Meadows on system theory and modeling. Uh, many of us have heard maybe of uh, Donella Meadows, who was involved in the Club of Rome report, uh, uh, Limits to Growth. Then Chris Biner, who is joining us today from Florida. He's a business professor at Seminole um, State College of Florida in the US. And he's the author of a book called Systems, uh, System Leadership for Sustainable Sustainability. I would like to hear more from Chris on his book. Uh, both um, Anupan and Chris are facilitators of uh, uh, some of our courses here on of our education center. And then uh, Sandrine is joining us today, Sandrine Dixon de Clef. Um, she's the co-president of the Club of Rome and has over 30 years of experience uh, working uh, in European and international policy. Sandrine is an expert in energy policy and is joining us today from Brussels in Belgium. And she has been working on a Planetary Emergency Plan, which is a partnership with different organizations. And they developed this Planetary Emergency Plan that was launched just a few week, weeks ago. So thank you for the three of us, for the three of you and the audience who is joining us today through uh, different platforms. So let me start this session by asking each one of you, the, our speakers, I would like to ask uh, first Anupam, to briefly share your thoughts on what is system thinking and um, what it has to do with sustainability and why do you think that is important Anupan, for the current times? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you from different parts of the world. I'm very happy that you could all be here. 
Uh, let me start addressing the question by actually going back to 33 years when the World Commission for Environment and Development actually tried to address the simplification of the idea of environment and development. So the World Commission on Environment and Development said that the environment is the home that we live in. And development is the changes that we do in order to make it livable. So if I were to try and simplify it in a similar manner and try to explain systems, then I would simply say that the idea of a system is to help us to distinguish our relationships with each other from our relationships with others. Let me explain. I think across the world, we have had a lot of folklore and stories that we have grown up with. And I'm going to use one such story that many of you may already be knowing in order to illustrate the idea of systems and the idea of sustainability. So I'm sure many of you have grown up knowing the story about the man with the goose which laid the golden eggs. So once upon a time, there was a man who had a wonderful goose and he had a wonderful relationship with this goose. And he used to feed the goose and every day the goose used to give the man a golden egg. And the man used to go to the market, sell the golden egg and get whatever he needed for his family. And he was living a perfectly happy, uh, content life. One day his wife told him that, look, this, you know, instead of getting one egg per day, why don't you actually try and take out all the eggs in the stomach of the goose at one time and we can become extremely rich right away. And of course, because the man was fond of his goose, he was very reluctant. He had a relationship with the goose. And, but after a lot of persuasion, he finally agreed to cut open the stomach of the goose and to take out all the eggs all at once. And when he did that, to their astonishment, there were no eggs in the stomach of the goose. And now they neither had the single egg that they were getting every day, nor the goose, and nor all the eggs that they ever dreamt of. So if I were to go back to what I just explained about systems, a system, the idea of a system helps us to distinguish the relationship we have with each other from the relationship we have with others. So here, Essentially, the, the man had a relationship with his goose and that was his system where they came together in a reciprocal relationship where the man fed the goose and the goose gave the golden egg and this relationship could go on. There was a different system which the man had and he participated in with his wife and his family and when the boundary could not be drawn and they came together with different purposes. And the purpose of the family was that we want more. And the purpose of the farmer was that he and the goose were in a different relationship. So what was a symbiotic relationship suddenly became an exploitative one. And you could not sustain the golden egg that came every day. So I think this very well illustrates the idea of both system and sustainability. So if we were to really extend this and again, look back at you know, the state of our world today, I think 33 years after the World Commission on Environment and Development, we still find that 166 nations across the world are today living beyond their biopotential. So just as this farmer uh, was being forced to go beyond the potential of the goose to lay the golden egg, I think 166 nations are being forced to live beyond the ability of the planet to give us the golden egg every day. We also have had 25 years 
of the conference of parties where world leaders from different countries have gone through a democratic process and they have been engaging in trying to address the issue of the climate crisis. But yet we find that we are nowhere close to resolving this problem. And we are just about seven years away from a 1.5 degree rise in global temperature. We also are at a stage where we are just about 20 years from the time that we framed the Millennium Development Goals, where we wanted to improve the lot of the world. And we are about four years away from the time that we started the Sustainability Development Goals. And yet we are far away from accomplishing any of these. So I think it is important for us to notice that this has happened essentially because like the farmer and his wife, we have not been able to understand the systems that make up our world. And unless we have an understanding of these systems and unless we have a systems literate world with systems leaders, we are not going to be able to really address the challenges that face our world. Today, we are an extremely organization focused world. And when we are organization focused, we forget that an organization exists in a system. It has a relationship with people outside the organization. And together, they exist as a system which may be, which may be symbiotic or which can turn exploitative if we do not pay attention to it and we are not able to deal with it effectively. So uh, I think there could be no better time than now to really start addressing how can we build the capacity of our leadership towards systems literacy and becoming systems leaders. So I will pause here and uh, maybe Chris can take over. Thank you, Anupam. And indeed, it is important for us to strengthen our capacity to understand uh, the systems uh, that make up our world and that all our activities and organizations are part of a bigger system. Chris, can I ask Thank you to jump in here? Thank you for that interesting story, Anupam. That brought back memories from my childhood of hearing stories like that and never understanding back then how prophetic that story would become as I've grown up. Um, the, when I was thinking about the question, my approach is to look at where have we come from and why are we not systems thinkers to get a better understanding of where we should be? Because I think we, we have a good handle in society on the pieces of the system. We, we're good at focusing on the components, the egg. I like that golden egg, so I want more. But we don't focus as much on the relationships. And that's what systems thinking is, is that we look at the whole system. It's a holistic approach where we look at the components and how they're related, interrelated, because the components are often insignificant, but how they interact is what really makes the system you know, dynamic. Um, and so an important assumption of systems thinking is that the components will change behavior either when they're separated from the system, when they're separated from the components or the system changes. So like with your story, um, the eggs were gone. We overuse the eggs and they're gone and they change their behavior because of something that we consciously did. So, so where we've come from, systems thinking has been around for millennia. Um, the, uh, Indian Vedic philosophers, the Greek philosophers, they all had a profound understanding of, of systems and how we were interrelated. If you go back to primitive humankind, I think they had perhaps the best understanding of how everything was interrelated. They might have been superstitious and thought the gods made everything happen and they needed to have rituals to make the sun come back and the days lengthen. But I think they had a profound understanding of systems I think in society, we've gotten away from that, at least in the West. Um, going back to the, uh, the Enlightenment, I think we, man became the center of our universe, humans. So we began to look at the world, um, Isaac Newton and others influenced a view of the world as a human-centric, as a 
mechanistic approach. Everything's a machine. So um, if something's wrong with the machine, we repair it. Um, and, and we'd look at humans as, as in the same way as a machine. If something's wrong with me as a human, repair it. If my bone is broken, fix it. If something's not working right, replace it. And so we, we tended to look at, at the world that way. And the unfortunate thing with that approach is that if, you know, if my automobile doesn't work and a mechanic will try to fix it, if he can't fix it, I'll get rid of the automobile and I'll go get another one. And I think we look at people the same way. If I can't fix someone, I'll divorce that person or I'll not be friends or whatever. But that's not systems thinking. And that's a very um, narrow symptom focused um, aspect of, sustain of, of, of systems thinking. So to address how does systems thinking, how do we apply that for sustainability? What's the relevance? Well, sustainability is complex, complex and complicated. Um, it's not one thing. It's not if we stop burning fossil fuels, the world would be a better place. Or if we make sure everyone has food, the world would be a better place. There's numerous components to it. It's a very complex, complicated process. So it takes something like systems thinking to really look at the at sustainability and to understand it's not just the environment. I used to think, wow, if we save the planet, we, everything's fine, but it's also the social, um, economic, environmental, it's all intertwined. So systems thinking is a good approach for addressing and accomplishing what we need to for sustainability because it makes us look at the relations and think about them and it makes us step out of our room and our shell because I have there's knowledge I don't have that I need to solve this problem and there's knowledge that Anupam and Sandrine and Miriam don't have and we can't do it alone it takes many people much knowledge many understandings of the relationship so it requires systems it, it, sustainability requires we stop thinking mechanistically and we start thinking systemically so systems thinking gives that uh, that mindset, a mindset where we realize that we can't just replace air with something else when the air is not breathable. We can't just replace drinking water with another substance. Um, we can't simply take a part when the environment's not working, just take a part out and put a new part in and the environment will be okay. It, it makes us realize that we've got to focus on the on the relationships that sustainability is not fixing the air or fixing the water it's fixing us and our relationship with them so that's kind of how i look at systems thinking and how we can and must use it to achieve sustainability thank you so much chris it's good to hear you and the very clear message on the importance or the relationship of system thinking and sustainability uh, we could almost say that sustainability and system thinking are synonyms. <laughs> oh. It's all about relationships and looking at the interactions. Um, so let me invite Sandrine Dixon the Clap, who is here with us. And thank you again, Sandrine, for joining us. So Sandrine, what, what is system thinking from your perspective? So I, I of course, am, am building on two beautiful renditions of what, of what systems thinking is. And, and I don't have much to add to what both Anupam and, and Chris have very clearly indicated is a holistic relationship. And understanding the whole is why everything has broken down so badly. So we are now at a time in history where the convergence of tipping points demonstrates to us that because we haven't put in place systems thinking, we are in a bloody mess. And in fact, as humankind, and if we go back 50 years to the Club of Rome's inception, we can see that Donella Meadows and those MIT professors at that time, but also all of those that Aurelio Pache, who was an industrial leader, really, had brought together to think about the human problematique. And we look at this human problematique and what they have written already in 1968. And we realized that we bloody never got the message. The message was pretty clear. 
It's exactly what Chris and Anupam have indicated. It's exactly what indigenous people have indicated. And as the stewards of the planet, they're the only ones who have demonstrated how we should be treating our planetary boundaries in a systemic manner. So what we've tried to do now at the Club of Rome, realizing that we never properly got it as human beings. And part of the reason why we never got it, and I would even say the major reason is that we continue to function in ego systems rather than in ecosystems. We continue to translate the systems thinking so that it actually never was truly holistic and only really helped us as human beings continue to meet our own needs rather than realize that by meeting our own needs, we were doing innate damage to ourselves and to the planetary boundaries. And so this disconnect between the reality of systems thinking and then systems acting is the biggest issue because the way in which we can truly put in place systems thinking is to put in place the governance requirements, the democratic processes, but also a series of integrated departments, ministries across different governments, a series of integrated thinking across and acting across the UN institutions, which by the way, are not working in sync and all have their own little pet projects and their own little pet theme, whether it be separating climate from biodiversity because we have a climate cop and we have a biodiversity cop, or whether it be just the way in which the UN institutions are there through the Bretton Woods and, and a total separation of really understanding that from the beginning, we should have set up integrated systems across our governance. But I, I would like to then take it one step further and, and look at the way in which this is really translated into where we are now. And, and that is this, this feeling that we are in the greatest existential crisis we have ever been in. That humankind has not actually integrated itself within the systems, but felt that it was omnipresent, omnipotent, overarching all the systems. And I think that is where now it's starting to bite us, as we say, and this is a good old American um, expression in the butt. It's biting us very hard through the convergence of COVID, a very strong health dimension of the planetary boundaries encroachment, which is through crises of climate change and biodiversity. And, and so I think that if we can continue some of that thinking into now, what do we do? And this is where we can go into the rest of this conversation, Marianne, around what's next for systems thinking and what's next for systems acting. What's next in terms of translating what we know needs to be the way forward in terms of this holistic approach to really solve the human problematique as already was pinpointed by Aurelio Pache and these great men and women that joined them and started the Club of Rome thinking and the many indigenous people in order to do them honor. And I'll just close with one thought, which is that unless we shift from the ego into the eco, we will never practice systems thinking. And as Jane Goodall said, we are supposedly the most intelligent species, but we are definitely not the wisest. And that is the biggest issue that confronts us today as we try to solve the major crises that we have created in a systems format. Thank you so much, Sandrine. It's so good to hear you. Um, Thank you. I, I certainly agree with you on the importance now to to see how can we make best use of system thinking. But um, from my experience um, in, in teaching sustainability um, for over 15 years, uh, what I come across quite often is that people have no clue about system thinking. And when they come uh, to hear about it, 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 it's very complicated. It's too complicated to deal with it. Um, so I, I have been thinking about how to make it simple 
um, in a way that people uh, are more willing to grasp with it. Uh, otherwise, the whole idea of system thinking and even sustainability continues to be within the realm of people who are used to talk about it um, or like and understand it. But the, re the reality is that 90% of the world out there cannot deal with it. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a challenge. Um, Can I respond to that, Marianne? Sure. Because I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think all of us, and I'm sure Chris and Anupam and anyone else who's practicing sustainability and has been in the environmental world for the last 30 or even 10 years, we'll say, we need to simplify this to the lowest common denominator. We, but we need to just bring it into people's lives. They live within a series of systems. They integrate their systems into their life every single day, whether they use a car to go to work, to then come back to home. We can talk about households, mobility, and energy use. If we come into the realm of climate, for example, and impacts, all in one way in which they, on a daily level, interact with different systems. So I, I think that if we get better at storytelling, and making it personal and converge that with the consciousness that we have now where people are in some ways more open because of COVID. Many are saying surveys in the UK and also in France have indicated that people do not want to go back as, to business as usual. They want their lives and their livelihoods. They definitely want to make sure they're healthy, but they don't necessarily feel anymore that ownership of a variety of different material goods is as important to them as access to healthcare, making sure they survive, getting food and water. That is the most important. So we need to tap into that. It's our responsibility as sustainability practitioners, governments, etc., to tap into that now. And if we don't do it, we've lost that opportunity. Thank you, Sandrine. Uh, Anupan, do you have any comments on this? challenge of making it simple for a bigger audience to embrace this idea? Yes, I think uh, this is definitely a challenge. And I think basically we have grown up in an education system which breaks everything up into components and tries to seek control. And we feel that it's the property of every object that actually is what is important. And we have forgotten that it's all about the relationship as Chris and Sandrine just pointed out uh, between things that come together. And as I highlighted, it's all about the relationship we have with each other. So I think uh, it's very important for us to ensure that people can pay attention to the relationships that they engage in every day and the purposes which drive them to come together for the relationships. Because essentially we engage in relationships because we, we come together for some purpose to interact with each other. If we don't understand these purposes, then we are not going to be thinking about systems. If we only think about our own individual purpose and we do not find common purposes, then we lay the foundation for creating exploitative systems. We lay the foundation for what can be called as a parasitic system instead of creating a symbiotic system. So whenever we come together for common purposes, whenever we come together for reciprocal interactions, then we create the foundation for a symbiotic system. So we need to help people to recognize that pre-COVID, we have been living in a world which is largely dominated by exploitative systems, which is largely where people have been coming together in order to find what they can pick up from the system rather than what will be reciprocal or for a common purpose. And I think nothing better than COVID to actually illustrate that this has happened because I think the first thing was the collapse of the health system. We discovered that we have been looking at the health system as an individual healthcare, not as a community healthcare. 
And therefore, when individuals seek uh, access to good health instead of the community, there is no way that we can prevent a pandemic. This is a global problem because we do not look at healthcare as a community issue where we actually ensure that the community will stay healthy. Uh, so I think similarly, we found that the food system also collapsed. The water system, as Sandrine pointed out, has been collapsing. So the fundamental needs that we have have been collapsing because all of these human-made systems that we have created, man-made systems, we have gone to create them for exploitation. We are exploiting nature, we are exploiting each other, and we are exploiting our natural resources and creating systems. So I think we need to you know, create systems literacy, particularly amongst our leaders, so that they emerge as systems leaders rather than simply as heads of organizations. So we need to help them to recognize that they need to be beyond heads of organizations as leaders of the system by bringing together people for common purposes. Thank you, Anupam. Bringing together pe uh, leaders and people for common purposes is quite a challenge. Um, and thank you for share, for pointing on the importance for us to see this difference between exploitative systems versus symbiotic systems and the importance of a shared purpose. And probably for all of us to collaborate towards a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world, we need to find ways to collaborate with a common purpose. Chris, would you like to share your thoughts on, on the importance of systems leadership into these current times we are living? Um, so, um, do you want me to, to uh, discuss system leadership? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, just um, the importance of that in our current times. Um, well, as you mentioned, I've, I've wrote a book recently on system leadership, and there's a broad interpretation of system leadership or systems leadership with the S at the end. Um, a systems leader is simply someone who understands and applies systems thinking in, their, in what they do. Um, and while similar in nature, system leadership, which is what I wrote about, is more um, about uh, how an individual applies systems thinking to to accomplish something, to uh, exert influence outside of their uh, their sphere of influence, and where the the, the concept came about um, around uh, the turn of this this current century, in the field of education, there were a lot of educators who wanted to achieve sustainable changes in their their system, um, improve grades, improve retention of students, improve knowledge. So they became what was known as system leaders that they would take whatever they've done and instead of saying I've done a good job, they would influence their entire system to, to make the whole educational system improve. And then kind of my inspiration when I was writing the book is I read a piece by Peter Senge, a very famous uh, systems thinker and, and um, holistic thinker. And he and his colleagues said that the only way we're going to solve problems, major problems in society is through system leadership, that we can't do it alone. I can't do it from my office. None of us on this call can do it. We've got to reach outside of our comfort zone and our boundaries and influence in the whole system, even people who won't listen to us or don't. Um, we don't have any influence over. We've got to have that ability to, you know, to reach across the boundaries. So um, I think that that that's what's necessary. We've got to have the ability, not just understand systems as we've talked about, we've got to understand what do we do? How do we influence that system? Um, and it requires kind of the, the, a model that I put together that um, about how, to, how I think system leadership is the, a way we can achieve sustainability. I came up with three propositions. And one is that sustainability is a natural environmental concept. So if we're going to achieve that, we can't do it by thinking, as I mentioned earlier, mechanistically. We gotta think how do natural systems work and does, how, how do we make them go back to working naturally? 
And then sustainability is a, a boundaryless concept. There are no borders. Climate change doesn't stop at the Belgian border. It doesn't stop between India and Pakistan. Um, the pandemic didn't stay in China. All of our problems that we're trying to address know no boundaries. So we can't look at our individual environment or, or location and say, this is how we do it. Um, just do it here and everything will be fine. But you've got to be a boundaryless thinker and a boundaryless influencer. As we are today on this call, we're all reaching all over the world and people will walk away and, and get something out of what we've said. And then finally, um, sustainability, as I mentioned earlier, is a complex, complicated process. So you've got to have a, um, a big picture perspective. Again, I can't just say, well, if I solve the water problems in my community, which Florida has a growing water problem that we're surrounded by 845 miles of coastline and water, water everywhere, but we can't drink it. And we, our water comes from underground. It has to be, um, it's pure when it's underground, but there's so many people coming here, so much development that we, we're running out of dr uh, drinkable, usable water in a state surrounded by water. So I can solve that problem, but I can't, but we've, I've got to, if I find a way to solve it or someone in my community does, we've got to be able to take that and influence other systems and say, this is how we solved our problem. Here's how, not try to capitalize on it and make a lot of money in water purification. And there's nothing wrong with making money, but let's share that technology and help other people. So I think um, understanding systems and then reaching across the boundaries is going to be key. You know, be afraid to, to break out of that comfort zone and, and you know, take action. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let's uh, uh, maybe come back to Sandrine. And we have a question here is, uh, can system thinking help us better understand the COVID-19 pandemic? And especially can system thinking, uh, how, can and how uh, system thinking can help us build the post COVID-19 world? Yeah, no. Absolutely, and, and really a fantastic question. And I would say again, as I said, it's a breakdown in the systems and the fact that we have not created integrated systems thinking that we are now facing COVID. So within a COVID world and the way in which we are now thinking of getting out, and I can speak really of, of specific conversations that we're having at all levels of leadership from community levels, for example, right now, Amsterdam has applied donut economics from Kate Rayworth, right? Which is clearly a systems approach to how we organize a city. Now, what's happened is we just had the deputy mayor of, of um, Amsterdam on, on a, a discussion around over Earth Overshoot Day. And she clearly indicated that because they had started to look at addressing resilience more in terms of climate change and the planetary boundaries. This was before COVID. They already felt that because they had opened up their mind in terms of systems relationships, that they could actually create greater resilience during COVID, that they were already setting up the conversations that were necessary with the right different departments to look at this from a systems perspective. You have the same with regard to the well-being economy governments. The, the, the incredible leadership of New Zealand and Scotland and Finland and Iceland during COVID, all of which are governments who have put in place, first of all, they're led by women who tend to be, apologies men, but good systems thinkers because already they are continuously thinking about the interrelationships within their brain, very left, right. But the fact of the matter is these incredible leaders had already put in place well-being economy structures and looked at new indicators to growth as a way to create greater resilience and very much built on systems thinking. Because of that, they have been rated the best leaders during the COVID crisis. And what's interesting here is the overlay of the human dimension. When we talk about systems thinking, 
And I think this is partly where we went wrong, is that we continuously, those that adopted the systems thinking, forgot to listen to what Donella Meadows was saying, which is that if we didn't bring this back to the core of the human being and their real needs, we would fail. Because that comes back to what Anupam and you've been saying, Marianne, we have to create the right stories to compel people to understand that this is about their lives. So what did each of these incredible leaders do through systems thinking and an understanding of the human dimension is all of them spoke directly to the heart of people. They immediately dealt with COVID from the beginning. They put in place the right systems reactions, bringing in the health experts as well as other experts sociologists, psychologists, etc., to work together to understand the best way to create the right relationship with people so that they would understand the pandemic and how to get out of the pandemic. And I think those are remarkable examples of systems thinking and systems acting in a situation of chaos. Now, what we need to do is design our way out of chaos. So we need more of those examples so that we actually can create and design now the systems frameworks that we need so that we can create the resilience before the next pandemic, the next impact of climate and also biodiversity loss. Wonderful, thank you, Sandrine. Thank you for your passion also and so, so clear. Um, Anupam. Uh, can system thinking help or how can system thinking help um, address the current COVID-19 pandemic? And especially, can it help us uh, build the post-COVID-19 world? I think it's absolutely the essential tool that we need to have uh, to build a post-COVID world if we don't want to create the same exploitative systems that we have been living with all our lives and also to ensure that we have resilience against similar pandemics that are sure to come and the huge climate crisis that is looming upon us. So I think there are a number of ways in which systems thinking can actually help us. So the first thing it does is it helps us to identify who are the actors, who are the participants, the co-participants with us in the systems that we are designing or we are creating. It also helps us, therefore, to understand what are the purposes, what are, what are the needs for which we all come together into the systems that we are creating, whether it is the health systems, whether it's the food systems, the educational systems, the employment systems, the financial systems. These are all human-made systems. These are what we create and we have been creating on the planet Earth ever since civilization came to be. So if we were to create a post-COVID civilization, these are systems which will have to be redesigned. And they can only be redesigned if we give up our thinking in terms of looking at organizations to looking at systems, where we recognize our relationships with each other. Only when we are able to find and get together these actors for common purposes, we will lay the foundation for the symbiotic systems of the post-COVID world. So I think that is essentially what we should be striving for. Thank you. Now, system thinking um, also has to, and sustainability also has to do with long-term thinking. Now, it's, it's the interaction of the current interaction, but also long-term thinking, this challenge of short-term versus long-term thinking. But given the, the huge uncertainties that we are currently living and having to address, how can system thinking help us with this idea or the need for us to lift up our eyes and have a longer horizon and plan and, and envision things in a, with a long-term thinking? Would you, maybe for Anupan and Chris first, uh, share with us how can system thinking relates to long-term thinking? So I like to start off by talking about the 
lifetime of a system. Every system, every relationship has a lifetime. There is nothing permanent. You know, there is impermanence in the world. Everything changes. So when we look at different systems, they have different lifetimes. The human systems that we create for our needs for food, health, employment, uh, entertainment, education, are systems which typically should last at least the lifetime of a child born today. And if we recognize that, then we start focusing on the time which is of a lifetime of a child born today, about 100 years, or what I like to call as the short now. And I call it as the short now in order to distinguish it from the short term that we have got so addicted to. So unless we move away from the short term addiction, where we simply say that I attend to what catches my attention. And you know, it's like a, when, a, when the mobile rings and we are in a meeting, the first thing we often do is attend to the mobile. And that's because it's crying for attention. Whereas we forget that the meeting that we are in is probably, you know, it's going to, it's looking at a more longer term uh, itself. So I think every system that we are a part of, there are so many things which cry for attention, immediate attention, and we get sucked into the short term. So I think moving from the short term to the short now, or the lifetime of a child born today, or the lifetime of the system that we are a part of is an essential, important ingredient to be able to make this shift. Great, thank you, Anupam. Chris, you're in Florida, and Florida is certainly uh, um, experiencing a very strong uh, impact of COVID. So how would you apply system thinking? How can it help us understand COVID and address it from your perspective and context? I think, you know, to answer that and to touch on the short-term focus, I think Homo sapiens is a story of a survivor species. If you look throughout our history, individually, cultures, societies, we're a species that thrives on danger, the woolly mammoth, the saber-toothed tiger, war, um, but we're short-term, so we always wait till the saber-toothed tigers, right, saber tigers right there, or until we're on the brink of war or the brink of disaster, and then we spring forward and we save the day and we have wonderful stories about how the happy ending. Um, I think the challenge is that that this is the first time, but with COVID, COVID, and if you expand it to climate change, this is the first time that we're at a risk of not surviving, that we may kill ourselves with climate change or that COVID may get the best of us. I don't think so, but I think it's that short term, let's wait till it happens and then I'll deal with it. And again, to touch on the storytelling, we hear numbers on the news and, but do you know anyone who's died personally of COVID and the average person doesn't? So I think we're, well, it hasn't hit me, so let's wait till it hits me. So I think what systems thinking does is it makes us look beyond the symptoms. And the, kind of the example I thought of as I was preparing for the, the webinar is that in Western medicine, at least, we tend to focus on the symptoms. You go to the doctor, you have high blood pressure or some other symptom, and the doctor does an exam and perhaps uh, some tests and then gives you a pill or gives you a, says you need a surgery and your symptom hopefully is cured. And if not, they've got another pill to, if you have a side effect, we've got a pill for that, relax, you'll be okay. So we have this system where you have a symptom and the doctor cures it. But we don't look at what caused that high blood pressure. Was it my diet? Was it insufficient exercise? Was it stress from COVID? Maybe that's what's causing my blood pressure to go up. We just simply address the, the symptom and not the, the problem or the system. So if you take that and you, and you apply that on a collective scale, 
without systems thinking, we're, we essentially do the same thing. Um, we're good problem solvers. When there's a famine, we send food. The world comes together and we send food. When there's a natural disaster, Haiti had a, a earthquake and a flood at the, nearly the same time. We'll send tents and we'll send supplies. Um, we're, uh, anytime there's a humanitarian problem, we're very humanitarian and we're good at problem solvers and we'll jump in and fix that problem. But again, we're treating the symptoms. People who are hungry, a starving nation doesn't want food. They want self-sufficiency. They want to know how do I take care of myself? They want access to the resources and they want the education to solve their problem. And um, sick people, I mean, doctors and medicine are nice. Sick, when there's an epidemic or a pandemic or an illness, people want healthcare and education. How do I not let this happen again? So again, collectively, individually, we're good at, give me a symptom and I'll fix it for you, I'll solve it. But systems thinking forces us to get out of that short term and what is really causing this problem? Because COVID is horrible. I don't want it to come back in two or three years. So instead of treat the symptoms, here's a vaccine, put on a mask and then we'll be okay. Systems thinking makes you say, what's wrong with the system? How did this happen to begin with? Um, system thinking, it's a good survival tool. It's a good tool for, for addressing something like this because um, it increases our awareness of how we might be part of the problem. You know, we're, we're good at blaming other people, but maybe COVID is because we're encroaching on areas and bio, uh, we're impacting biodiversity and species are becoming extinct or we're in, the, in their zone and we shouldn't be. Um, so we're causing part of the problem. And it's, we're always good at saying it's someone else's fault. Maybe system thinking makes us think, what's my role? Do I have a role in what went wrong? Um, it helps us to, to figure out by looking at the system, what went wrong, look at the relationships, not the component and what relationship is broken. Let me fix that. Let, let's not work up, worry about the symptom. Let's worry about the relationship. Um, it gives a, a, a method of bringing um, people together again for a long-term approach. And systems thinking helps us to, to look for a high impact area where I have resources and Anupam has resources and Sandrine, all of us have resources, where do they need to go? And if you can't look at COVID, climate change, any crisis from a systemic point of view, you're going to send resources to the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong manner. So systems thinking forces you to step back and say, I know I want to treat the symptom, but where exactly is the problem and how can I prevent the symptom from, from occurring because of treating the problem? So I think it gives that longer term, bigger picture um, relationship approach to COVID or any other, whatever the next crisis is, it'll help us. I think that systems thinking helps us understand it and know how to respond. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have a few questions, a number of questions coming from um, through YouTube or here through the Zoom platform or Facebook. So I would like to invite the speakers to, to start reading the questions that is in the chat box. But one of them that came from Kimboa Richard on YouTube has to do with a question that I wanted to ask. So I'm going to take that one. And uh, it has to do with um, how can system thinking help us accomplish the visions uh, we have for international initiatives, such as the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the SDGs, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So there are a number of various different uh, initiatives. Sandrine mentioned that. But the question from Kimboa Richard uh, on YouTube was, um, how can this skill of system thinking uh, help uh, and why is that global and national level decision making and planning has not taken it up uh, with the expected zeal? And, and how can they, they make it happen? So Sandrine would like to take this. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, as I completely agree that it has taken us far too long and, and we are now seeing the ramifications of the lack of real systems thinking. Um, and I think part of that, as I said, is that 
structures have been put in place which are very much linked to one particular system without looking at the interrelationships. But I do think, again, as I was saying, that we are in a moment of, of, of real opportunity for systems thinking, and we can see it being applied now in a variety of different ways. So here are some examples. At the international level, COP26, there will be net zero dialogues. We as the Club of Rome have been asked to open up with systems thinking. So we've been asked before the net zero dialogues, not to just lay the pathways for what are the different sectoral interactions amongst the different systems, but how do we bring that into the convergence of tipping points, an understanding of the relationship with the bigger planetary system, an understanding of the relationship with the health system. And in fact, on that opening day, of the COP26 dialogues, which by the way, will be on the 9th of November, and I hope many of you will join from across the globe, there will be an afternoon dedicated to the health issue and the convergence between climate and health. We are seeing the conversation and a new leaders declaration, which we've helped create, which will be launched actually on the 28th of September, which talks about the planetary emergency. This leader's declaration is being launched at the Biodiversity Summit before the COP15 Biodiversity Convention conversations. And that in itself is also talking about the interrelationship between the systems. And it's calling on leaders to put in place the right systems thinking to address biodiversity, not in a vacuum, but for example, both as an underpinning sickness through biodiversity loss that we need to fix. So by looking at the global commons, by looking at the way in which we deal with nature, but also nature as a solution, which also for the first time we start to talk about. So those are just some examples, not to mention then the one that I said about donut economics and the fact that Kate Rayworth can't even keep up with the demand of working with local authorities on trying to put the donut into place, or the fact that there are more and more citizen assemblies that are calling people that are calling for, for a systems approach of their policy makers that we can now tell. So what I would like to call on all of us who are entrenched in systems thinking is no longer just to talk about systems thinking as a theory, but to start to talk about systems acting and show the case studies, show the way it works in practice, show why it's so important as we move forward during this time of pandemic. Otherwise, we will continue to isolate ourselves as a bunch of theoretical thinkers in an ivory tower without it being actually taken on board through the hearts and souls and brains of every single citizen across this globe. Great. Systems acting. Let's hold on that. That's great. Anupam, how can system thinking help us accomplish uh, the vision of these many different international initiatives and efforts? I think in some ways, again, the World Commission on Environment and Development made a very key observation. And what they said was that, you know, all the challenges that we are addressing, we are acting independently in a fragmented way uh, with closed decision processes. And if we were to really look at, you know, 33 years later, this remains true. So when we actually introduce the idea of systems thinking, I think the first thing that we tend to do is we help organizations to become integrated. We help them to break away from fragmented thinking. We help them to break away from independent thinking. So unless we recognize that even to accomplish the sustainable development goals, we cannot say that this is to be done independently by an organization. We have to get people who are concerned, for example, with uh, you know, goal 13, uh, 
all, all the actors who are part of systems which contribute to goal 13 need to come together in order to make sure that we are going to be able to address climate crisis. If we simply uh, are not able to get them together, then uh, we will not be practicing systems thinking. So I think it's important uh, that once we introduce systems thinking, we will be really addressing what uh, the WCED highlighted as being a major, major problem in the way in which decision-making happens across the world. So uh, I completely agree with Sandrine that we need to be able to help different organizations to find uh, ways to act with systems thinking. So uh, many of us have been working with grassroots organizations and with governments across uh, the continents in order to help them address exactly this, you know, I, 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 exactly to find out how can they accomplish the sustainable development goals? How can they actually ensure that the four pillars of the Earth Charter can be accomplished? How will we actually ensure that the respect and care for the community of life is accomplished? I think in a in a lot of ways, I also want to highlight that systems thinking is something which will change our attitude towards our interactions. It is not something which is expected to change. Uh, you know, there are, there, there are many ways to look at systems thinking. In fact, there are many different systems theories and systems practices. And I think part of the reason why despite you know, uh, so many decades of systems thinking being around, uh, it has not uh, grown to the extent that we feel it should have grown. Because I think uh, a lot of the practices still remain very difficult to implement uh, in a shareable way. I think the most important thing about a practice becoming useful is to make it shareable. So when we can actually understand that what is the system that we are talking about? Uh, why has engineering science really spread across and made such an impact on our civilization? Because an engineer can actually lift this up and say, this is a mobile phone and repair it and change it and make it work differently. So till such time that we cannot actually pick up a system and say, this is my system. And this system comprises of these actors and their relationships. And this is where these relationships have been soured or do not have common purposes. I will not be able to correct them. So therefore, it's very essential that we create or use tools of systems which are going to make our system shareable for us. So only then will we be able to create examples where systems thinking has translated into systems practice and systems action and systems leadership that we can, you know, ensure that we create a sustainable world and a resilient world. So I, I think uh, what we are proposing at the Earth Charter to actually help people to become systems literate is aiming more or less towards trying to create a common framework where we will be able to share our understanding about systems fundamentally. So I think that's the starting place. Wonderful, thank you, Anupam. Chris, would you like to come and share your thoughts on this question? How can system thinking help us um, address all these somehow related initiatives? I think, um, Human nature, it is our tendency is to perhaps not trust other people, to question other people's agenda. Um, when we meet in any kind of forum, I, I don't have a lot of experience with international initiatives other than the Earth Charter. Um, but from my business experience, anytime you have a group of people and you're trying to negotiate, the assumption is that everyone's out for their own good. It must be a win lose. Uh, confrontation. So it becomes a confrontation. And I'm sure at the United Nations and other organizations, many events turn into confrontations. 
because it's human nature to question other people, mistrust, I think, to a degree. And it's hard to get people to agree to begin with. I mean, I have, I thought of a, a quote from a very good friend of mine who used to say, if, if two people agree on everything, one of them's not necessary. And so I can only imagine to get a United Nations assembly with several hundred people and get them all to agree on anything. So I think that's um, the challenge, but where I think where systems thinking comes in is that again, we tend to, to focus on our differences with other people and mistrust and what are you out for? Are you out to get me kind of thinking? And I think I see that a lot in my country when, when we look at the United Nations and there's been a lot of criticism of the World Health Organization um, with under COVID. And I think we tend to mistrust in the United States, we tend to mistrust a large initiative coming in and saying, hi, we know what's best, this is what you should do. And we're very mis trustful of that. But I think where systems thinking comes in with this is that um, instead of focusing on our differences, you speak a different language from me, you have different needs in life than me. Um, instead of focusing on the differences, systems thinking for forces us to focus on what do we have in common, those relationships that um, black, white, brown, yellow, English, Spanish, whatever your political persuasion, COVID will kill you, or there's a good chance it will kill you if you get it, or if not, you'll be really sick. So it really doesn't matter what your political or ethnic or religious persuasion is. We've got a common area of agreement, but we've got that in common. Climate change won't stop at the US-Canada border or at the Belgian French border, I think they border each other. Um, I'm getting a nod, so good. So my geography is still good. Um, but, um, but systems thinking forces us to say, I don't agree with you. Um, we have different opinions, but we both might die from this. We both might have our river dry up. We both might have a consequence. So I'm still not going to agree with you, but when it comes to whatever this problem is, let's sit down at the table and put our disagreements on the side for a moment and what's the problem let's fix and what's the root of the problem and what's what relationship in the system is it that's causing the problem and let's address that instead of just the, our differences and you know the components and the blame and whose fault let's not worry about whose fault is it let's let's fix it because it's going to kill us both thank you chris um we have a question that came from my guests uh facebook and it's Mika Tan uh, from the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, which is a youth constituency to the Convention of uh, Biological Diversity. And Mika asks, well, okay, I have a question. Imagine we have uh, reached a sustainable world. What might the day-to-day -day look like in concrete? How do we get our food, water, shelter, how do we travel, connect with others? Are there boundaries um, we as civilization need to accept in order to stay within planetary boundaries? Um, Sandrine, would you like to take this? Sure, I, I think that's really a fantastic question and, um, and one that, that needs to be answered. It, it's really interesting if we look at COVID, there's, you know, those that, have, that romanticize COVID to a certain degree, if you can romanticize COVID, because of course, all of us understand the incredible pain of people's loss, whether it has been their livelihoods or friends, family, etc. But there are those who felt that under COVID, because we were restricted in a variety of different ways, lack of air travel, because we could actually go out and ride bicycles. And in fact, the number one product that skyrocketed in terms of purchases during COVID was bicycles. Um, that, that actually a, a COVID world was the type of constraining world that we might need. And that clearly is a romantic notion, a predominantly Western romanticized notion. Also a notion which doesn't take into consideration women that were beaten, more violence, et cetera, people that had seven people in a room in an apartment block. So we need to try to figure out what were the benefits 
from restricting the way in which we live our lives. That doesn't mean that our lives were worse, but what were some of the benefits that we can try to replicate as we move towards a sustainable world? And I think some of that is localization. However, when we look at many of these and here come the systems issues, right? What happens when we localize? So yes, the perfect community would be a well-balanced, holistic community that is thriving, that is putting less pressure on boundaries in the way in which they grow their food, so regenerative agriculture, that actually regenerate and have a circular economy within their community, and that the full value chain is as much as possible fully localized. But we know that if we localize it, we have an impact in particular in the West on the South because we're not gonna be buying food from the South. We're not going to be buying all of our clothes from China. We're not going to be buying all of these materials from Africa. What do we do then? And so that's the complexity of the systems approach. And that is why we have to figure out how do we build thriving communities across the globe? And this comes back to a little bit Chris's point, which is what COVID has shown us is that everyone can get COVID, but also we are as vulnerable, each of us as the most vulnerable or weakest link within the chain. Hence, if we look at a systems approach and if we move towards sustainability, I want us all to stop thinking about this wonderful romanticized, almost liberal white vision of everybody growing organic and everybody think being fine because they've localized their community and they're doing permaculture and everything's perfect. Because that's not perfect unless we ensure that the same type of model is replicated in every single Southern country so that we don't have the same types of impacts from our lack of trade, from our lack of buying products outside of these communities. So the vision of what sustainability looks like has to be one that takes into consideration the North-South dynamic, has to be one that addresses building up communities from scratch across the globe that can be still interacting, but in as sustainable as a way possible. And that means that we will almost never be 100% sustainable. That is impossible. But what we need to do is try to see as much as possible, where can we shift those linkages that we have so that they are more sustainable in terms of our materials, in terms of the way in which we grow food, we use water, and in particular, in the way in which we interact. And so I'll close with one of the, I think also, very important considerations that we have to think about. And we had the same after 9-11, the debate around international travel, the debate around meetings that are so important, the personal connection that we can all have with each other so we can learn and we can grow and we can exchange our stories in person. Probably we're going to have to stop some of that and we're going to have to continue to exchange and to grow and to learn to actually do the right thing, whether it be via Zoom or I don't know, maybe we'll all get flown next to each other through, I don't know what kind of visuals or, but anyway, I'm sure there's a new system coming out that's, that's in technology. But the fact of the matter is we do have to think also about what are the ramifications of all these international gatherings of travel, which is so important because it's important for the livelihoods of many countries. It builds cultural connections but by the same token, it has a huge impact on our planetary boundaries. All of these are super tricky questions that can only be answered if we put in place a systems approach. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandrine. And we know the Club of Rome have been, has been working on these issues for so long. So, and of course, now under your leadership, um, we hope uh, these ideas will be moving forward. Um, 
Anupam, do, would you like to, to build on that? Can, can I just add, sorry, Marianne, I sure. must leave. And I just, I there's been some beautiful um, remarks on, on the chat and, and also coming from those of us who are speaking here. And I just, I want to echo what, what Sam has said, Crowell, um, which is that actually, yes, this is the most essential conversation that we could have. So we need more of them and we need to translate them into action. And, and unfortunately, I, I have to go on to another um, conference panel to try to bring some of this into that. Um, but um, let's, let's keep this going. Let's keep it live and let's see how we can work together. And thank you. Thank you so much, Sandrine. Anupan, would you like to build on that? Yes. Uh, firstly, I want to thank uh, Mika for this question because uh, it actually made me very nostalgic. Uh, I remember in the 1990s, Donella Meadows used to do exactly this. She used to ask us to envision what a sustainable world would look like. And uh, she said, unless you can actually envision what a sustainable community is, we will not be able to create one. And I think uh, many of us have been trying to practice that, uh, well, for a long, long time now. For me, in some sense, I think a sustainable world will be very diverse. It's not going to replicate the same kind of living in every part of the world. So for me, it will really mean that people will take into recognition the values, the cultural values that exist across the world. And rather than simply create a monoculture of organic farms and solar farms, we will actually find that people will be creating lifestyles and communities which are going to be very different from each other. So if we want a sustainable world, it is not going to look uniform as the modern world has increasingly become. It will have to be very, very different in India or in Asia, in Europe, in America, uh, in Australia. Uh, it's, it's going to look very different. I think the needs of the people in different continents, in different geographies, vary depending on the geographic and climatic conditions over there, depending on what resources are available, and uh, depending on what kind of values they have for living their lives. So I think it's important for us to learn to respect that. So the reasons why people come together into communities or into systems in different parts of the world are very different. And therefore, what identities they acquire, what kind of uh, uh, attitudes they have towards the systems that they are a part of also tend to differ a lot. And therefore, I think we should increasingly learn to respect uh, this diversity. And since Mika comes from an institution which is concerned with diversity, biodiversity, I think she will be the one who will be the most to recognize the need for diversity of solutions and diversity of visions for sustainable communities across the world. Let us not try to think of a uniform vision of sustainable communities across the world, but a diversity of visions. We all need to encourage people from different parts of the world to envision what their sustainable world will look like. And certainly it's not going to look like what world we live in today. Wonderful. Thank you, Anupang. There is uh, someone in our audience here um, <clears throat> that I'm very honored to have her here with us, Akpezi Ogbuye, who, is, who has joined us and is following us. And she has, so Akpezi was the head of the Environment Education Program of UNEP for many years. And she's a wonderful speaker herself. Um, so Akpezi asked an interesting question here about that is on the chat is how do you apply system thinking in addressing the gaps in education? So I would like to ask Chris to jump in on this. So how do you apply system thinking in addressing the gaps in education? And it has to do with the, 
the other question I wanted to ask, uh, which is uh, how do we recognize the systems we want to sustain? So Chris. Let me try to merge those two questions and, and come up with a good answer. Um, I think there's no one, as, as uh, Anupam and um, Sandrine said, there's no one vision of a sustainable world. Um, it's not going to be identical across the globe. Um, and there's no one way to educate because everyone has different standards, needs, and, and so forth. So um, the challenge is, is, to, is to make it unique um, to, uh, I, several, several of us have mentioned storytelling, and I think that's a key part of education uh, because a lot of people are mistrustful of us, of academics, of scientists. Um, we're in our ivory towers. We write fancy papers with really long words to show how much, how educated we are. And we throw a lot of numbers and gigatons and things like that out. And the average person does not understand that. Um, and a lot of people, whether it's um, their religion or their upbringing, um, and not just in, in the South, but here in the United States, a lot of people are just skeptical of science. So when we start talking um, climate change, they're mistrustful. Why? My climate looks okay outside, so it can't be changing. When we talk education, I ha have so many people tell me, Oh, and education's not that important. I know someone with a college degree who's working at McDonald's. And I know someone without a college degree who's a millionaire. And so we try to, uh, we're very mistrustful. So I think we have to bridge that gap with education. And again, systems thinking allows us to do that because education in the United States to make the world, make our country better is different from education in India or in Zimbabwe or in Costa Rica, we can't make it a cookie cutter and, and apply it globally, but we can um, use systems thinking to think about the stories that need to be told. And because I think that's what, when you tell someone climate change or when you tell someone there's poverty in another country, they can't grasp that. But when you show someone a photo of a person um, and there's one of the South Pacific islands that there's, I've seen a photo in the past of a man standing knee deep in water because at high tide his island is gone. And you, when you show that story, people are like, oh, wow, what can I do? But when you tell them there's too many gigatons of CO2 in the air, then it's like, oh, you're, you just think you're so smart, don't you? So the storytelling I think is so, um, so critical. And I wanna tie that into your um, question, Miriam that, you know, how do you know what systems to address? How do I know how to address the education system or what aspect? And to me, it's, it, it's all unique. So we have to do it in our own backyard. There's a, a proverb that charity begins at home. Um, I would love to stop the burning of the Amazon rainforest. I think that that's detrimental to my air here in the US. It's detrimental to the world. Um, there's so much value in the Amazon rainforest, but I, I live several thousand kilometers away and I can't go there, certainly not very often and do anything. And I don't speak Portuguese or a native language. Um, I can come up with a lot of reasons I can't go to the Amazon and, and do anything, let alone try to educate those people to do something. Um, I can make a donation and make an impact, but that's it. But I can have an impact locally and I do that. I was a business manager and I decided to become a, a business professor and I teach sustainable business and I'm able to that's the system I can influence because I can speak business I can speak marketing to people and when a business person you know to go to the storytelling when a business person says why should I be sustainable that's all liberal tree hugging I can say do you want your business to survive because everyone else is doing it if you don't do it you won't survive do you wanna make more money? If you become sustainable, you can make more money. And so how I tell the story, if I just say you need to be a sustainable business person because of climate change, I'll, a lot of people will ignore me when I tell them this is a good business model for your business to survive. So again, it, you know, to kind of, I've, I've kind of done a, a, a round to try to touch both questions, but um, 
the key is, is storytelling and finding what system can you affect and have the maximum benefit and where can you educate and how it's, it's going to be unique, but, but all of us have something to bring to the table to take it from an intellectual master's degree PhD and go up to someone on the street, a child on the street and say, tell a story to, um, to, to impact them, to bring it to their level and to educate them. I think that's, that's the answer. It's not gonna be us, you know, these webinars are great, but if we don't have action, systems action afterward, then we're failing because we've got to go out and, and, and do it and at, at the grassroots level. Mm, thank you, Chris. Now I would like to, to bring three questions at once <laughs> uh, because we are running out of time and I, I would like just us, uh, to extend it for a few more minutes. Uh, the first one is from Luis Figueiredo. Luiz is uh, in the southern part of Brazil. He has worked all his life in the private sector with big major companies. And he has a question that says, uh, how can we build a superior level of consciousness in a global perspective and considering the majority of humans? And he says, when we see many global leaders from different nations and enterprises with a narrow view of system thinking, just thinking about themselves uh, and not having common and global priorities. Mm. Do we need to keep fighting day after day? How do we build that uh, new level of consciousness? Um, do, do you recognize the progress in that direction in recent years? So I, I would like to ask Anupan to reflect on that. And before that, I would like to invite uh, Sifan Dian, uh, who is joining us uh, here, and actually she will come to the platform, so you can just open your mic, Sifan. Um, thank you, Median. Uh, good morning, I'm Sifan, and I'm from University for Peace in Costa Rica, and it's a great honor for me to attend this webinar, and I really appreciate the comments the professors have made on system thinking, and I totally agree with uh, Professor Anupam about currently we need, we not only need to have um, the leaders for organizations, but also we need an emergency leader. Um, so regarding the system leadership, I have one question for um, Dr. Chris and Professor Anupam. So um, currently WHO uh, World Health Organization probably is the most important international organization to help countries to fight with COVID-19. However, it's actually facing some challenges such as the country, um, United States, very powerful countries drawing back from uh, World Health Organization. And um, in this situation, what do you think WHO can do to maintain an emergency leader um, instead of just a leader, um, international organization leader. So uh, what do you think they can do in facing this challenge? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, well, to address this issue of consciousness, you know, how do you evolve a consciousness? I think it's a very important question. It's a very important thought. I think it's important to recognize that as long as we are thinking about ourselves and uh, not thinking beyond ourselves, there is no way that we will actually come to find consciousness. Actually, I'm reminded of Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. And he wrote this famous book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in this book, he actually identified three ways in which you can you may find meaning. So the first he the third thing he said is that if you devote Anupan, your life, can you can you repeat Anupan? We couldn't hear the first thing. So the first thing he said was that if you devote your life to something or somebody other than yourself, you will find meaning. The second he said was that if you devote your life to a purpose or a cause larger than yourself and your life, you will find meaning. And the third he said 
is if you learn to accept what life offers you, the pleasure, the pain, the sorrow and the joy, all in the same way, then you will find meaning in life. So I think if we were to look at, you know, devoting ourselves to something other than ourselves or a cause larger than ourselves is actually taking a systems view. Because what we are doing is we are no longer focused on me as a participant or me as an individual, but I start looking at how do I interact with something other than myself or some cause other than myself, my own. How do I fulfill needs other than my own? So I think in some sense, uh, when you move to systems thinking, and particularly when you start looking at systems from an actor perspective or a participant perspective, you tend to recognize this far more easily than if you were to look at systems from the perspective of looking at elements which are related to each other. So that is particularly why I tend to keep on repeating and saying that, you know, identify who are the participants in your system and understand why they have come together and understand if there is a common purpose. And if there is a common purpose, and if there isn't, then we need to evolve the consciousness of the system to create a common purpose. And if, if the consciousness of the system does evolve, it will be because a common purpose has been found. So I think that is fundamentally important uh, in order to create some kind of a consciousness. So uh, then if I turn to the question of Sifan, Sifan, can I request you to just remind me of your question again? Um, yeah, my question is um, how will WHO World Health Organization, although they are facing some challenges, but how could they still maintain to be an emergency leader instead of just ordinary leader? So, so yeah, so, if I were to ask you, I, I would probably ask you back this question. When you talk of WHO, you're talking of an organization. You're not talking about a system. So if they were to be an emergency leader, then they, all, they need to first look beyond themselves as an organization. And they need to really recognize you know, who are the participants besides the WHO who they actually serve. And together, they need to have a common purpose which they are trying to accomplish. Unless there is that common purpose which is recognized, they will remain an organization which is having organizational goals and missions, which may have nothing to do with the community that they need to be serving or that expects them to be serving. So therefore, I think if we really want to ensure that an organization like the WHO remains relevant, it needs to find a way to understand the system that they are a part of. I'll give you a short, exa short uh, example to say what this really means. So Peter Drucker, who was the guru of management, was called by an American hospital to formulate a mission statement for the hospital. So he asked the trustees for a few weeks of time and he went and talked to the community. He went and talked to the trustees. He observed the doctors, the patients. He sat in the uh, hospital for a long time. And just like you had asked, how does the WHO really become a leader? the hospital wanted to become a leader. So therefore, uh, after a few weeks of observing the community and talking to people, Peter Drucker said he was ready to talk to the trustees and the trustees were excited and they all got together. And Peter Drucker said that I have two questions for you before I actually share what I think your way of emerging as a leader would be. So the first question he said is, can you all tell me what you feel 
should be your mission. And one by one, each trustee got up and one said that we should become the number one hospital in the country. Another said we should be the largest franchisee uh, operation, uh, create the largest franchisee operation across the United States. A third one said we should have state of the art facilities. Fourth one said that we should have cashless transactions in our hospital. Another one said that we should have internet and television screens in every hosp uh, hospital room and so on and so forth. Uh, so after hearing all of this, Peter Drucker said, okay, so now I have my second question for you. Can you all tell me who is your audience and what is their need that you serve? And of course there was pin drop silence because in all the statements that had been made, nowhere had the trustees of the hospital identified who they served and what was the need of these people that they served. So then Peter Drucker said, in all my observations, I have seen that the only people that you serve are those who are afflicted. They are the ones who come to your hospital. And the only need of these people that you can actually serve is to provide them assurance. So your mission, if you want to become a leader, is to provide assurance to the afflicted. So I would ask the WHO, who is your audience? And what is the need of this audience that you actually serve? So if you want to remain a leader, then you really need to say who your audience is and what is their need that you really serve. Thank you, Anupan. Uh, let me ask now Chris uh, Wiener to come in and jump uh, on the question of uh, Sifan, um, um, who is here with us. Uh, but also let me ask uh, the, what, the last question that comes from Facebook. It's from Fatima Oliveira from SEIN USA. Um, Chris, uh, would you take a look at that question from Fatima that says, we all need first to understand the shared humanity. We all share to develop. We all share to develop a sustainable and fair world for all. While some nations make a, a lot of money, some starve to death. This is not a humane way of living. Any comment on that? So, Chris. Okay, I'm glad I get a quick chance to respond to Stefan's question, um, because storytelling is kind of. It has a topic that's come up and I want to use that as an example. I want to share a story from early in my career. Um, I was a, a business employee and a management or leadership position came up and I interviewed for the job and my, my supervisor said, why should I give you the job? And I said, well, I'm qualified. I've been here for several years. I'm smart. I know how to do the job. I think I'd be a good leader. And he said, if you want to be a leader, you should first act like one. And I didn't get the job. And I, that puzzled me. I didn't really know what he meant at the time. And later it came to me and I'll, and I'll share a definition of leadership. And then I'll tell you what the epiphany that I had. Um, leadership, a uh, famous text by Norhouse uh, that I use in a lot of classes. Leadership, people think it's an act or a thing or a science. Leadership is a process. Leadership is the process of influencing a group of people to accomplish a common goal. And so you don't have to have the job. You don't have to be the manager, the president, the director of the World Health Organization to be a leader. You have to lead. And so I thought about why didn't I not get that job? And I realized that later that there was an employee that we all made fun of. And I, that was wrong, and I was young and immature at the time, but we all made fun of this man. And I was good at making impressions of him, and I, every time someone would make fun of him, I would make fun of him. And so I became a leader. I led everyone to laugh at this man, not in front of him. We did it privately. And we all thought it was just innocent humor, but I think he knew. 
And so I was demonstrating leadership. I was a bad leader. I was making fun of a coworker. I was um, not leading people to be productive. Our job was to sell electrical equipment, but we weren't selling. We were making fun of someone. And I thought of that and I'm like, wow, I'm a horrible leader. But I, once I realized that, I learned what I should have been doing. And so I demonstrated leadership. So where I'm going with this is that the World Health Organization won't be effective if they have a meeting and say, raise your hand if you want to be the leader and they appoint someone as a leader. Someone has to demonstrate leadership. Someone has to step forward that may not be in charge and say, this is what needs to be done. I have some ideas and demonstrate leadership and hopefully they'll be effective. Um, don't look for leadership support from our current administration in the United States. I think I'm not saying anything out of turn. I think everyone understands that. Hopefully that changes soon, but, um, but you can't, we, we can't, you can't blame. The, the U.S. can't blame the WHO and the WHO can't say, well, it's all America's fault that we're not successful. Someone's got to say, people are dying. Let's put our differences aside and come together. So that's what it's going to take is someone not to be appointed and paid to be the leader, but someone to step forward and say, something's got to be done and I'm the person. So um, I'll transition quickly into the, the question from um, Fatima, um, Fatima, excuse me. Um, because there's, it, it's, it's sad that we have wealthy countries, including my own, we have wealthy oil producing countries and we have people starving. And that's only going to be solved through education, through systems thinking, um, through storytelling. And, I, and I'll share a, a, a story. When I was a, a child, my brothers and I would sit around the dinner table and if we didn't like what was served for dinner, we didn't want to eat it. And my mom would say, there's starving children in Africa. You should be ashamed of yourself not eating that food. Those children are starving. And we would jokingly say, well, let's ship it to them. They might like it better than I did. And that was, that was horrible. But, but we would joke about that because we, why are they starving? Look at all this food that we have here. Why are people in other countries starving? But one day I saw images of that and of, of people not eating you know, bloated stomachs, not like in America, bloated because we ate so much, bloated because they had no food. And I saw that image and I heard that story and I'm like, it's kind of like my analogy about the Amazon. I can't go to the Amazon and do anything to help them. I wish I could. I can't go to Africa and help them. But the story impacted me. And so telling the story is half the battle to, to show people People's islands are being flooded. People are starving in other countries. People don't have access to health care. Tell the story and then encourage people, to, as we've been talking, think systemically. I can't go to Africa and feed those poor people. What can I do? Can I educate someone? And I've had students over the years from various African countries who've all said, when I get my education, I'm going back home to, to make a difference. That's what I can do. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm not alone going to change the world, but by thinking systemically and telling the stories, um, I can have an impact. And maybe if enough people come together, um, we can solve the problem because the problem isn't those people in those poor countries don't want us to give them money. They want access to resources and food and what they need. So the solution isn't let's all do a fundraiser and send money to these countries. The solution is let's show them systemically how to solve the problem. So again, I think the stories are going to be the solution, not the, the academic, we're all smart, we have the answers, but just telling the stories and enough people hearing the story. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chris Wiener. Uh, Thank you so much, Anupan Sarap, for joining us. And of course, uh, Sandrine was here with us as our, our guest speakers. Uh, I want to thank all our audience, engaged audience uh, that we had from uh, YouTube or Facebook, um, and also our friends, uh, Suyu and Cindy, who are helping us to also do a live stream uh, to China.
So um, I just want to end here by saying there's much to do um, to learn how to grasp with these complex ideas through a, a simple mindset or through lenses that we can all relate to and, and figure out different ways in which we can contribute uh, to the current challenges that we are facing. So warm um, and best regards um, and wishes uh, from here, the Rashad Education Center at the University for Peace in Costa Rica. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.